the City Travel with Kids podcast, helping you plan big city trips with kids. Brought to you by Little City Trips. Hello and thank you for joining us for this week's City Travel with Kids podcast. I'm your host, Marianne Rogerson, and today we are talking all about Rome in Italy. Today I'm joined by my co-host, Kerry Hedrick. Hello, Kerry. How are you today? Yeah, I'm very well. Thank you, Marion. So today we're going to be hearing all about Rome. Have you ever been to Rome? I have, but all of my trips were pre-kids. I've done some solo trips and I've travelled with my husband before. And I remember lots of walking, lots of piazzas and lots of vino, but I wouldn't particularly know what I would do if I was to take my kids. How about you, Marion? Have you been to Rome before? (laughs) Well, I'm very similar. I've only been once and it was on a rugby weekend to watch Scotland play against Italy. And there was... uh, was (laughs) That's very familiar. (laughs) (laughs) This was obviously before kids and uh, there was a lot of beer drunk and not much culture involved. Although in my defence, we did go to the Colosseum and we did drive past the Vatican on an open top bus tour. But um, yeah, I would. I think it's safe to say that neither of us are in a position to talk about Rome. Have so. No, so that- well, my, my children have researched it thoroughly. My, my middle son particularly is obsessed by things like the Colosseum. He loves the fact that the Vatican City is the smallest country in the world. So hopefully these are all things that Marta can shed some light on for us today. Yes, well, thank goodness we have her to tell us what to do in, uh, in Rome with kids because we clearly have no idea, so... Uh, We'll (laughs) look forward to hearing what she has to say later. Uh, Okay, so before we get on to the Rome interview, each week on our podcast, we like to highlight a question or discussion from our City Travel with Kids Facebook group that we think would also be useful to our podcast listeners. So Kerry, what's today's question? Sure. We are going on a four day city break to Rome from the UK and we're flying on a budget airline. We really want to go hand luggage only. I always overpack, so I'm looking for your best tips and tricks for some efficient packing. So Marion, what do you think our reader can do? Okay, well, she's actually asking the wrong person because I'm very bad at, at light packing as well. But I do know the theory behind it, so I can tell you what I know. One of the key things, I think, for light packing is uh, to create a capsule wardrobe. So by that, I mean you have a few main items that will go with everything. So you kind of think of the colours that and like white tops and black trousers and things that you can mix and match. And that means you don't have to have a separate outfit for every day. Um, I would also recommend looking ahead at the weather forecast and knowing exactly what the weather has in store so that you're not packing a lot of unnecessary items that just aren't going to be used. Um, Yeah, that's one I'm definitely guilty of is packing everything I can think of just in case it rains, just in case it's sunny. But if if you look just a few days out at the long term forecast, yeah, it can definitely help reduce your packing. Yeah, um, and that, that's all I've got, I'm afraid. I'm not very good at this. I usually pack about six pairs of, <laughs> six pairs of shoes. So what have you got, Kerry? <laughs> uh, we, we have certainly learned over the years, we have gone from being that family that has multiple car seats, strollers, three suitcases, the just-in-case, the one with the porter car at the back. We're not quite at the carry-on only stage, but we're much better at being more compact and we don't normally travel to most places with just one suitcase. So we do have some upcoming budget flights coming, but we're planning to bring just a one suitcase between me and the three kids. The thing that I would do and recommend is certainly packing to a smaller bag so if you know you've only got seven kilos each don't start with a huge suitcase start with the smallest bag that you think you can fit everything in and certainly limiting the number of toys I think that's been my nemesis over the years is you know we kind of we start with an iPad then some headphones go in and then a few car trucks go in and the, the pile goes on and on so I think being quite strict with the children about how many items are coming and let's be honest if it's for four days it's not the end of the world if you haven't bought every single favorite toy Exactly. And kids are terrible, aren't they? My kids literally fill their bags with so much useless stuff. And I try and tell them, you're never going to read all those books. You're never going to do all those puzzles. Because I know they're just going <laughs> to think sit- maybe, Perhaps using an e-reader would help. Uh, certainly we've moved to using Kindles now rather than iPads and we can download the books onto the Kindle. So that's one way we've reduced a little bit of weight in the kids' bags. Ah, clever. Um, and the other thing I think is very uh, important if you are traveling um, carry-on only is to remember that your toiletries need to be travel size. You need to go and buy small or decant into small containers and make sure you have them in a see-through plastic bag so that you can easily put them through security when you get to the airport. Yes, that's essential when you are juggling children and bags, what have you, is to be able to quickly get through the security screening. Sure. Okay, let's focus on this week's destination city then. It's known as the Eternal City and the capital of the world. 
It's famous for its rich history and architecture and, of course, its fabulous food. But just how family-friendly is Rome for a city visit with kids? Earlier this week, Kerry sat down with our Rome expert and found out everything we need to know about planning a city trip to Rome. But before we hear the interview, I just want to remind you that if you want to be kept up to date with all our latest episodes, then don't forget to subscribe to the podcast. And if you have any questions about Rome after listening to today's episode, or you have any other family travel questions, you can come and chat to us in our Facebook group, City Travel with Kids. We would love to see you there. You can also find lots of information about Rome on our family travel guide on the Little City Trips website. Finally, I want to let you know that you'll be able to find a copy of our show notes from today's episode on our website at littlecitytrips.com forward slash podcast and we will link to any relevant and useful information mentioned in today's interview there. So without further ado, let's hear all about Rome. Today we're introducing you to Marta Corriali, who's going to be talking to us all about Rome. Marta is a mum of two, originally from Rome, and she now lives in Dublin. She's a regular visitor, so she's familiar with the challenges and the excitement of being in Rome with kids. She is one of our co-hosts here at the City Travel with Kids podcast, and she's also one of the co-editors of the Litty City Trips website. She is the blogger behind two family travel blogs, Learning Escapes, all about worldwide cultural travel with kids, and Mama Loves Rome, a specialised family travel blog all about Rome. So I don't think we've got anyone who's better placed to talk to us today than Marta about Rome. Marta, welcome. Kerry, thank you so much and thank you for having me. So tell us, what makes Rome such a great city to visit with kids? Uh, Rome, well, I am biased, of course, because Rome is my hometown. But I think even if it wasn't, it's a city that is likely to really kind of capture the imagination of kids and adults alike, like all ages can fall in love for Rome. There's a lot to do for children, there's a lot to do for adults, and it's a city that just mixes, you know, culture and play really well. Sounds great, but I can't wait to dig into it. Before we get too far into the details, can you just give us a bit more information about what people might need to know before planning a trip to Rome? So is there any important things if I'm considering what time of year or what I need to what I need to yes. do? Before? Yes. Now, Rome is a good year round destination in the sense that, you know, the weather is kind of mild. It doesn't have exceptionally cold winters or anything like that. But some seasons in Rome are definitely better than others. The best time to visit Rome, especially with young children, are the spring and the autumn. At this time, Rome is bright, the weather is mild, usually sunny. You get a bit of rain in April, but overall, you know, chances are you'll get good weather. Autumn in particular is a time of the year that people maybe don't think much, you know, about in terms of tourists, but it's really crisp and sunny in Rome. So that's a great one. Um, the only thing to be aware of in these two seasons would be that spring, especially during the Easter holiday, gets really, really busy in the city so that's just one thing to keep in mind uh, the worst time to visit Rome I would say is the summer it gets really hot and sticky um, the city has a problem with mosquitoes that at that time of the year reign absolutely supreme now they're not dangerous they don't carry you know illnesses thankfully but they are a pain and the second problem is the heat because Rome in July and August gets unbearably hot and humid you know, so that's, you know, people maybe don't expect kind of humid heat in Rome, but it makes it really unpleasant. Crowds are heavy in Rome, but to be honest, that's the case almost year round. Like Rome, it's so popular. I think what happens in summer is that the crowds, it's mostly tourists. You have few locals, especially in August, Romans just disappear. So summer, it's just, you will not get an authentic, nice feeling for the place. I feel. Spring and autumn, yes, low season, winter months like February could be good as well. Prices are lower as well at that time. So my advice, spring and autumn first, winter second, summer last. That's great. So moving on from the seasons, is there anything else we need to know in ahead of our Rome trip? Well, a couple of things I would think I would say are really important to know. Uh, the first one is book early. If you're going to Rome, if you're thinking of going to Rome, the moment this seems like a realistic plan, just get your bookings together. Get your hotel booked. And if you're hoping for some guided tours, which I do recommend, 
get the booking in early because Rome is popular. Accommodation in particular has very high prices if you leave it to the last minute. So I think especially for a family, you know, you're looking for a bigger room, you're looking for an extra bed, you just need to plan early. Um, the other thing that I believe people need to know about it, Rome is very busy and traffic is intense. So when you plan a trip to Rome, you want to make sure that you stay in a location and plan your days so that you don't have to be in traffic any more than necessary. What about public transport? What sort of public transport system do you have? So Rome has an extensive network of buses, trams and metro. So you can pretty much get anywhere by tra public transport. But for families in particular, I really do not recommend relying on it too much. Um, there are a couple of problems there. The first one is the schedule of buses is erratic at best. So you <laughs> never know if, you know, you're waiting for the bus. Is it going to come in, what, five minutes, half an hour, an hour? No idea. <laughs> there is an app, but I find it hugely unreliable. The next thing to know is that you cannot bring an open stroller onto a Rome bus, you always have to close it. So you, if you have a napping child, you'll have to take them off the stroller. So just on the topic of strollers, how do you find strollers on the streets in Rome? Hmm. <laughs> this is an interesting question. Uh, Rome is not particularly stroller friendly for a few reasons. One is that, uh, you know, it has its famous cobblestones that are wonderfully charming, but really bumpy when you are a child on a stroller. Def definitely my memory of what the Rome streets are like. Yeah, that's, so they're, they're, they're great, but they're greater if you don't have wheels <laughs> to negotiate them with. And the other problem in Rome is that cars are often parked on the pavements. So if you're hoping to go for a leisurely stroll with a stroller, like it's a bit of a slalom kind of exercise, you know? Right. Um, I find the best way is to have a stroller that has slightly uh, bigger wheels. You know, the teeny tiny wheels are not great on cobbles. But the other yeah. thing that I find for stroller, if you can get a very compact one, because you will find yourself opening and closing it often, lugging it onto your back and just, you know, not using it in several locations. So we, we might need slightly bigger than your teeny tiny fold up airport strollers, but big enough that it's got wheels that can handle the ground. Exactly. Uh, if you have a young child, a very young child, I would highly recommend to bring a carrier. That yes. It, it may be tiring for a whole day sightseeing with the carrier, but it will save you a lot of hassle. And anything else we should know before we go? Like, uh, for me, if in particular, do I need to speak any Italian to be in Rome? Um, you don't. I would say uh, especially tourist establishments, restaurants, hotels, shops, Almost everybody has some English. Um, I do find, however, little things, even just, you know, the basic greetings, the please, thank you, they do go a long way in Rome. And I would say in Italy in general, I think people really appreciate if you try and make an effort. And is there anything else we want to touch on just before we jump into yes. the things we should be doing? One last thing that I want to say to uh, visitors, I always say it because it really is counterintuitive, it's about money because small purchases do not happen by credit card in Rome. So if you have a child, you want to get, you know, gelato, ice cream, a slice of pizza, you have to pay cash. And I would say bring small notes. Um, shops don't like to break big notes. And if you pay with a 50 euro for a purchase that's worth five, you will not make any friends. And Romans are grumpy, you know, <laughs> like, they'll, they'll, they'll let you know. That's really helpful to know. Right. I would really like to jump into what we can do in Rome now. So if you're ready, we'd like to know if we had three days to spend in Rome, what would we do with those? three days yes now you can see a good bit of Rome in three days and I think with children the best way is to mix up your days so you have let's say the morning visiting one of the main Rome attractions and then the afternoon devoted to a more child-friendly kind of activity so for instance on the first day I think the best idea is to start from a visit to the Colosseum. 
the Colosseum is maybe a bit of an obvious starting point from Rome, but it is amazing. And it's a place that is just great for both adults and kids. You reach it very easily. You can get the metro or the bus there. And once you walk out of the metro station, the Colosseum is just right in front of you. And it's huge and is exactly what you and the kids have seen like in the photos, except a hundred times bigger. Um, the Colosseum, I would say, depending on the time you have and the age of your kids, you can decide to only see the outside, which again has got this big why factor and it is interesting for kids. But if you can, I do highly recommend a visit uh, inside as well. You can book different tours. I highly recommend a guided tour just to make sense of what the attraction really is. And usually, you know, they take anything between one and a half to three hours. With kids, my recommendation is to get a complete tour. This means that you get to visit the main uh, arena. So what used to be, you know, the stage, the center stage of the Colosseum, but you also get to see the underground passages and the top tier. And the underground passages are absolutely great for kids because a good guide will show you all the places where the animals used to live. You know, the Colosseum was this big theater when they had these crazy shows where exotic animals fighting. So that's just something that kids usually really relate to. That's... Yeah, I can definitely see my kids being excited by that. Exactly. And you do not see it unless you book a tour. So that's, you know, that's important to know that you will actually, if you just walk into the Colosseum, get the cheapest tickets just for the arena, you miss out on, on a lot. And the top tier, I have to say, it's not really for kids. It's more for the parents. It's a treat for the parents because the views over the city are incredible from there. It's just, you're so high up, it's really beautiful. And actually, maybe I didn't say I should have probably started with this. Uh, when you book a tour for the Colosseum, make sure you book either a skip the line tour or a reserved entrance slot. So, you know, a ticket that allows you to jump the queues or just not queue at all. In the busy season, which for the Colosseum is almost all year round, you have lines that last over three or four hours. So it's just not a chance to take. And is there any particular tour companies do you know that do Coliseum tours that, that are more family geared? Yeah, yeah. Like I took uh, two different tours and I would say one or the other, you know, would suit uh, different needs and different families. Like one option, and this is for slightly older kids, is to book directly with the Coliseum. Uh, not many realize, but you can book a ticket directly with the attraction and it's a reserved entrance ticket, which means you just show up at the time shown on your ticket and you don't have to queue. Um, the website for this is an Italian website, it's coopculture.it. And the one you want is the full tour uh, in English, I mm -hmm. presume, <laughs> for main area, underground passage and top tier. Perfect. So, we will link that in the show notes in case anyone didn't catch the name there. Perfect. And what was the second one you were going the to other, recommend? Yeah, so the other one is a specifically family-oriented tour. And I took it with my two kids, I believe it was last year. The company, it's called Rome for Kids. And I believe they recently rebranded into a Global Dream. They have small family tours. They have several around Rome, actually. And the one they do in the Colosseum, it's really nice for kids. And it comes with an added bonus that is that after the Colosseum, you get to see the Forum, which is uh, oh. beside the Colosseum, uh, but it's much harder to appreciate unless you have a guide showing you around. This was going to be my next question is can, can we fit both of these things in in the morning or are they really two separate activities? Absolutely yes, no you can see them in the morning, they are beside each other, they make sense if visited together because in a way then you have in one morning a very good grasp of, you know, ancient Rome and also different era at that time. Like in the forum, you see the more ancient parts of Rome, the Republic of Time. You can climb up the Palatine Hill, which is where the Emperor's Palace was. Now it's in ruins, so it's important that the kids don't expect like a big castle 
sky yes. place but it's beautiful and it's it's a large outdoor area so uh, it's pleasant with kids because you know it's it's not it a playground space to run around. but you yeah. are outside now the problem yeah. with the forum is that unless you have a guide it's almost impossible to understand what it is there is hardly any information panels um, it's just like it's a great place for a stroll, but it's not a great place to learn anything unless you have an expert with you or a very, very good guidebox. If you want to do them both by yourself, you can, I would say, do plan three to four hours to see them both. OK. With kids. And then uh, after we have finished that, that probably takes us to at least lunchtime. Are there places to eat anywhere around the Colosseum and the Forum? Yes, there are many, because one of the beautiful things about this area is that ancient Rome is actually in the heart of modern Rome. <laughs> so it's actually a really, really handy place to visit. Like there are a few really nice restaurants, both just beside the Colosseum. This is one I'm really fond of that's called Cafe Cafe, which has a really nice, very buffet which mm -hmm. you know makes it for easier lunch or you can go for a more traditional sit-down meal one thing to know in Rome is that sometimes or I would say most of the times restaurants don't advertise children menus as such so you may have the feeling that the, the restaurants in the area do not cater for families but the reality is they all do like in Rome unless it said explicitly that they do not want kids. The restaurant is child friendly and they're all able to prepare, you know, either a simple plate of pasta or, you know, it's, it's the one city in the world I don't worry about whether my children will eat something. So. Exactly. And I mean, to be honest, in Rome, the other big, you know, secret weapon or not so secret weapon for parents is pizza. You know, yes. like, all <laughs> I only have one child that won't eat pizza. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you can sit down and have it or like for lunch, usually what is more common is just to get, let's say, a piece of pizza. Like I would say a slice, except in Rome, it doesn't come in triangular slices. It comes in rectangular slices, <laughs> but you can get, yes. you know, a takeaway <laughs> slice of pizza almost anywhere. After lunch, what I would do on the first day, I would go towards the Trevi Fountain. The Trevi Fountain is is a bit hit and miss because it, like it's stunning, like it's an incredible place, um, and kids like it because the tradition, you know, requires you to get a coin and throw it into the water, and that you know it's supposed to bring you back to Rome sometimes in the future. Uh, my kids, for some reasons, are all over this. They always gonna go, and we end up having all our change <laughs> ending up splashing in the fountain. The only problem with it is that it's really crowded right. so i would yeah. say walk that direction see how it is if you see that the crowd is excessive during the day come back a little later and maybe just stop for gelato nearby but that would be my next stop it's a beautiful area of rome plenty to see lovely for a stroll um, and is this all walking distance? So if we start the day at, at the Coliseum in the forum can we walk to trevi fountain or do we need transport sorry say point? that again uh, are we able to walk between the Colosseum yes, and the Forum? Sorry, and yes, sorry, yes, you, yes, you are. It takes, it's a short walk, but in, you know, 10 to 15 minutes. And with a few more minutes, you can even get to the Spanish Steps, which, like, I'll be honest, it's a very scenic part of, of Rome. Like, it's beautiful, and I do recommend going to see it. That, that's not an awful lot for kids to do there. So I would say the second part of the day, it's more for for the adults. Sounds like a fairly full day one. Is there anything else we're going to squeeze in or should we jump to day two? I would say with kids, just jump to day two. On the awesome. second day, I would start from what is my favourite part of Rome, which is the area around the Pantheon. Now, the Pantheon is a very peculiar building. Um, kids may have seen photos of it because its peculiar characteristic is to have a dome with a massive hole in the center and the hole is there by design so basically what happens is that you walk into the pantheon you look up and you see the sky so that's always a bit of a you know either a surprise element if they don't know or you know just as like oh it's actually a hole and does it rain inside you know because of that and the fun answer about it is, is that it does rain inside the pantheon 
And the whole building is built to have a very peculiar system, kind of drainage system, so that when the rain comes in and hits the floor, it doesn't flood the place, but rather it gets redirected down, you know, underground and just flows and that, away. It doesn't actually work. <laughs> it does. It does. It does work. Um, yeah, that's what happens when the Romans build a city. <laughs> I tell you, the Romans with this kind of stuff were amazing, much better than us <laughs> modern ones, you know, like <laughs> trust ancient Roman infrastructures much better <laughs> than newer ones. And when you've got an ancient Roman city, the one thing that's still left standing after the buildings fall is the drainage system. <laughs> no, exactly, exactly. Um, like the one thing about the Pantheon, like I do say it is fun for the kids in terms of the hall and everything. Now, it's not a hugely entertaining place for them. Like this is a place that the adults go to and you can gather these fun facts for the kids. But I think it would be unfair of me to say, you'll go there, the kids will have the best time. Like they won't, they'll be entertained for a while. But, you know, it's a sightseeing stop. One thing that is really fun for kids if they like cats, which I know not all kids do, is that very close to the Pantheon, there is a small cat sanctuary. And this is a small cat refuge, refuge where you can go and just cuddle kittens and older cats. And the beautiful thing is that it is hosted in an ancient uh, site. It's actually on the location where Julius Caesar got murdered. And you cannot visit the ruins as such but you can get a glimpse of them from the street and if you go into the cat sanctuary so again it could be and i know it is for my kids uh, like a fun way to have a you know a furry cuddly stop <laughs> like my kids we go to rome is the one thing they want to do go and cuddle the kittens <laughs> so it works um, um would this take us a full morning then or is there anything else we should do in the morning in the morning i would say between the pantheon and the cat sanctuary like uh, just take a stroll in the area this is the area of rome with the famous cobble streets so it's really pleasant it's just full of things you know there are small churches or small shops and beautiful buildings hidden courtyards so it's a great you know place to just wander because the morning is sightseeing and seat exploring more than really for children what i would do on the second day is to foresee some playtime for the afternoon and a place that i highly recommend especially to young families is the children museum of rome called Explora. Nothing's particularly Roman about it, like it's a children museum, it's not an art museum, but has a lot of really interactive installations. There are, you know, water games, there are machineries, Leonardo's machineries, you know, reconstructions of interesting engineering um, feats, and it's a great place for kids to, to play and learn. It's also a great place for really young kids because they have a soft play area for toddlers. Um, yeah, that sounds perfect. And is everything in English and Italian or? Pretty much, yeah. Like the installations don't uh, have any issue to, to be used in, in any language. They're pretty straightforward. The museum also has workshops. Um, some are in English but many are in Italian. I would say when you're visiting, you don't need to do the workshop. You can enjoy the museum even just, you know, without engaging much with those. And a good thing about Explora actually is that there is a restaurant on site. So once you're there in the afternoon, the kids can play. And if you're tired, you don't want to venture back out on the streets. You can just have pizza in the museum. Which That's really handy. Yeah. Excellent. That sounds like day two pretty much filled up. Should we head on to day three? Okay, so on day three, I think the big site that you probably still want to visit in Rome is the Vatican. It's St. Peter's Square and the big basilica. Um, it is a bit of an undertaking with kids to see, you know, such a big kind of historical site, but it can be done and it can be quite fun. Um, the big decision to make there, if you just want to see the church and the piazza, you know, the big square in front of it, or mm -hmm. if you want to go to the Vatican museums, which are amazing, they're a very big art museum, but, you know, they're a museum, so you've got the usual concerns with kids, will they be interested in it, and how long will their attention hold <laughs> in such a big space. If you want sure. to go to the Basilica and Piazza, that's easy. The Vatican is technically a different state from Italy, but there is no border control. And what happens is you just step into St. Peter's Square and you find yourself in the Vatican. 
as opposed to Italy. My kids love this. They love the idea that on foot you cross an international border. So that's usually a big reason to go to St. Peter's Square is just to have an extra country on your list. Absolutely. I'm fairly sure that's what my kids would love about it too. Yeah, exactly. Like it's fun. It's a nice idea for them to wrap their head around and the square itself. It's really beautiful. So there is the visual element for the parents as well. The church facade is incredible. The big colonnade around it is really beautiful and it's a big open space. So even very small kids can enjoy it, you know, even literally just running around it. It's fun. So it's a good place to see with kids. And what about the Vatican Museum then? Should we uh, try to attempt it with our children or have you got a, a recommended way to do it? I would say it depends. The Vatican Museums are really beautiful. There is incredible art inside. So if you love art, if that's your thing, definitely try it, go. However, the museums are really big and really, really crowded. So it's not something you, let's say, leisurely walk in, have a look and go out. Like you need to plan in advance and you need to have a full morning available to visit them. So it's an attraction in itself. It's a big attraction in itself that will take half a day. With kids, the way we did it, and really liked was with a private family tour. Um, the company we used is called Rome for Kids and they give you skip the line tickets to the museums, which you want because the line can be crazy long. We're talking hours of waiting in line. And uh, Rome, <laughs> yeah, exactly. And Rome for Kids also gives you, you know, a private guide that they just know on which parts of the museums are interesting for kids and they have a treasure hunt type of approach. So oh, that's fabulous. Yeah, it's really nice. And um, so there's, you know, they have a little, you know, things they need to look for in paintings or, you know, maps that are hanging on the walls or statues. And um, then the visit for us included the Sistine Chapel. Um, the Sistine Chapel is beautiful, but again, it's really busy. So our guide sat with us before we went in and showed it to us on the iPad so that the kids were able, you know, once they were in to just spot things so it was a bit of preparation for them to go in so I would say if you want to go to the Vatican Museums with kids that's the way to do it. Oh it sounds fabulous we'll make sure we link in the show notes then how you can get hold of those specialised kids tours. Mm -hmm. Definitely yeah. Uh, and then after we have spent our time at the Vatican you are saying that's at least a full morning if we head to the museum where would we head for lunch or for the afternoon? Now the area around the Vatican is really nice so I would recommend to stay in the area for a meal. The area is called Borgo and it's just beside the Vatican. It's basically between St. Peter's and the river and it's full of places you, you can't go wrong really. Also with kids, like you can have a simple like, pasta dish or pizza. So I would take it easy in that area. If you haven't seen the museums, you can also take a stroll to the castle that is in that area, Castel Sant'Angelo. You can visit inside or you can also just take in the view from outside. It's a really impressive building and it's a castle. So, you know, kids tend to like it. There's always some Ca castles are always a winner with the kids. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So I would say that that's an easy one. Again, it's busy. So if you want to visit inside, I would recommend you plan it in advance. But if you just want to take a walk in the area and see it from outside, there's a really nice lawn outside as well. So you can even just have a picnic or just get the kids to run around a little bit. It's a beautiful setting. So I would finish my morning there. Fabulous. And then where are we heading in the afternoon on our last day? I think for the last day, especially with such a busy sightseeing morning, I would head to the park. There is a very big park in Rome called Villa Borghese, which is beautiful. It has several things inside. Uh, some are, you know, just playgrounds or, you know, small kiosks for having snacks and coffee. You can rent um, quad bikes and there is the zoo. So uh, an option is to have like a really child-centered afternoon at the zoo, which my kids sometimes really like, you know, no matter where yeah. we are, zoo is always a hit. <laughs> and if I wanted to end my trip with that quintessential Italian experience, you know, having dinner in a piazza, where would we head to for the evening? Well, actually from Villa Borghese, there is a place that it's quite handy to reach, which is Piazza del Popolo. 
it, it's mm -hmm. right under Villa Borghese. So Villa Borghese, part of it is on a hill, so just under it. And Piazza del Popolo is a beautiful, beautiful large piazza with two twin churches. And um, you have terraces where you can have like a aperitivo or a juice, you know, with a beautiful view. And that area, like it's full of restaurants. So you can have, again, pizza or your last Roman meal there very easily. It's really scenic. It's really beautiful. Oh, it sounds fabulous. Right. I, I'm feeling exhausted just thinking about these three days. But if I had a little bit longer to spend in Rome, what would you recommend? Either extra activities or perhaps some day trips we could add? I would probably go on a day trip. One that I really like is to a place called Ostia Antica, which is an archaeological site just outside of Rome. But again, it's open air. It's really child friendly. It's a good place to get some fresh air and space in beautiful surroundings. Or I would go to the beach. Rome is not far from the sea and on the good season, uh, go onto the coast. It can be really beautiful. You know, you can just play in the sand and, you know, paddle or even not, swim. Yeah, not something I've I thought of associating with Rome. So thanks for that tip. <laughs> Yeah, it, it's like an hour or so from the city. So, you know, so the Rome is not on the sea, but it's really easy. And not many people realize it indeed, but no, it's a lovely thing to do with kids. Oh, that's super. Now, we did touch earlier on about um, good places to stay. Have you got a couple of sort of favorite hotels in Rome that you would recommend families seek out? Yes, yeah, so there are a couple of hotels that I do recommend and I think are good for families in the sense that they have, you know, nice rooms, nice welcome, but also like a very good look location and one is near the Pantheon it's called Le Clarisse al Pantheon it's a really nice hotel and again like it's a stellar location like you're in the center of everything you can walk walk anywhere from it and another hotel that I do recommend it's called Colbe spelt with a k it's a four-star hotel and again it's really nice it's close to the main ancient sites in Rome city centre and has some nice greenery, like a little yard. So that is really pleasant. Oh, they both sound fabulous. So again, we'll make sure we link those in the show notes so people can look them up. Yeah. We've talked a lot about food already as well. And I guess being Italian food, it normally is a crowd pleaser with kids. But if we had mm -hmm. um, particularly fussy kids or we wanted to go somewhere particularly special, do you have any absolute favourites we should look at? Um, there are some restaurants that I keep going to with the kids every time. There is a really nice one called Piccolo Rancho, which is near the Trevi Fountain. So that's a good address and again, a good location, a place you may find yourself close to, you know, in your wanderings. And it's a simple but really good quality, like Italian food. And another place I uh, really like, it's not exactly for children. It's a wine bar, which I know sounds strange, maybe as a family recommendation, but you do get this in Rome. It's like it's a small restaurant where you get like a nice earthy homemade meal and parents can have a good glass of wine at the same time, you know, with the kids. I'm liking the sound of this. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, you know, the kids can have, I don't know, lasagna or something, you know, that they will like and you can have a more, maybe a refined meal and like a glass of wine. So it's, you know, it's family friendly in the sense that it pleases both uh, kids and adults. <laughs> That sounds perfect. Now, just before we wrap up, we also like to ask our guests what would they would pack? Is there any particular items that are essential that we make sure we include when we're visiting Rome? Good walking shoes. I thought you might say that. <laughs> yeah, like it's very easy to clock in 20,000, 25,000 steps a day in Rome, even with kids. So good walking shoes. And another thing I recommend to pack, and again, maybe not an obvious one, if you're going to Rome in summer, get your mosquito repellent. Rome has a lot yeah. of mosquitoes and you just need it. Excellent. Um, Marta, you've actually provided us with a packing list as well, which we will link in the show notes as well. It's on our website if you're looking for exactly what you need to pack for Rome. Right. Now, we'd like to finish all of our interviews asking the fast five questions. You are our first interviewee. So are you ready? <laughs> I am. Go. <laughs> Right. I would like you to tell us about one hidden gem that we won't find in the guidebooks. One hidden gem I recommend to families to visit is the Rome's Pyramid. The Rome's Pyramid is immediately outside the city centre, but it's a very peculiar building because it's the only pyramid you have in Rome. And it's really nice to visit with kids because there is a nice like green area beside it as well. So that, that's a very good one. Excellent. 
What's one thing we should splurge on? I would say location of your hotel. You don't need to splurge on the stars of your hotel or because in Rome, hotels are often pretty good quality, even, you know, in lower categories. But the location, I would say it's worth spending money on to be in the city centre. And what's one thing we would save our money on? I would save money on tours. A lot of places in Rome you can actually visit on your own. So I would put money on, you know, maybe one place you really want a guide for. But for the rest, I would try and do it yourself. Uh, one app that we can't live without? Google Maps. Very simple, straightforward. You need your Google Maps in Rome and you need a lot of battery on your phone. <laughs> you do. <laughs> and, and where would we go if we wanted to have a playground for the kids with a coffee and a view? I would head to the so-called Colle Oppio, which is the hill in front of the Colosseum. There's a little kiosk for a coffee and it's within like a park and there is a playground there as well. So that's where I would go. That sounds absolutely is super. Well, thank you very much for being our very first guest here on the City Travel with Kids podcast. Um, if anyone wants to learn more about you, Marta, where can they go to find out more information about Rome? Uh, well, there are three main places where you can find me. One is a Little City Trips itself. <laughs> uh, one is my uh, family travel blog called learningescapes.net, which talks about all our family travels, but has a big section about Rome in particular. And I also have a specialised website called mamalovesrome.com, which is all about visiting Rome with kids. That's fabulous. If you would like any of the show notes from today's episode, do hop over to our website, which is littlecitytrips.com slash podcast. And you can also jump across to our Facebook group, which is City Travel with Kids. If you pop in there, we've got loads of other parents around who can help with your city-related travel questions. And Marta will, of course, be online as well to help with anything specifically related to Rome. Of course. Thank you for having me.